Content warning. Imperialism, slavery, racism, Nazis, Martian cannibalism, and bad astronomy. Action! Excitement! Horror! Romance! Thrills and chills! Swords and sorcery! Rockets and ray guns! A dizzying panoply of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination! What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on What What Mad Universe. Leo St. Clair, alias the Nyctalope. Who in the world does not know that name and its reputation? Officially sanctioned but free to act on his own initiative, he had organized at his own expense an expedition that had forced the surrender of the last distant warlords in southern Morocco. He had discovered and rescued the King of Spain, who had been abducted and imprisoned by a gang of terrorists. In China, accompanied by 30 volunteers, he had captured and killed the triumvirate of brilliant but insane masterminds who had been planning to turn their vast Asiatic empire into a hellish anarchist haven, subject only to their bloody and barbaric whims. For these deeds and others no less peremptory, he was famous throughout the world, but he was more famous still because he merited the strange title of Nyctalope. Hi, welcome to What Mad Universe, the show where we talk about the origins of science fiction, fantasy, pulp, and and its relation to modern pop culture. I am Philip Rice, and with me, as always, is Adam Prosser. Hello. <clears throat> and I need to drop the radio voice, or the <laughs> old-timey radio voice. Oh, it works um, great. I like it. Anyway, yes. <laughs> it's hard to keep up. Uh, it's perfect. Uh, today we're talking about a uh, book series uh, called uh, The Nyctalope by um, French author Jean Delahir, uh, sorry, Jean Delahir, um, that's my best approximation of the French pronunciation I found. Um, the Nyctalope. <laughs> sorry, I did not like this yeah. series. What did you think of them, Adam? Um, well, I, I've only read the first book, or I guess technically the second book, I, I, <laughs> whatever, we'll, we'll get talk into about that, that in a minute, but uh, the first book... Um, and um, it's, uh, I didn't, now you, you read these before we even started the podcast, right? You were reading. I read the these. first one uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you've been complaining about them to me for years and talking about how bad they are. Ma maybe so, I, I played them down too much. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> it, yes. I think that that's what happened because I thought it was, I mean, it's clearly not good. Um, you can, you can tell that they are books that were written uh, in a sort of white heat, ground out and thrown up for publication. And as uh, Brian Stableford, who's the sort of annotator and translator, says, um, you know, you can tell that he wished he'd been able to go back and rewrite some of it. <laughs> uh, because, but he didn't you know, bother when it was novelized later. Right, exactly. It was kind of like chapter one, I fell off a cliff. Chapter two, ah, I just remembered I have a parachute in my back pocket kind of thing. You know, like that that sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah, that, actually, there's a quote from the, from the intro, I think, from the second, uh, or the first one. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, one of them. <laughs> right. Um, uh, from Brian Stableford that I'm going to read out in full here because it's it's delightfully catty, I think. Um, <laughs> okay. New recruits to the field had various strategies available by which to armor themselves against that disdain. Uh, the disdain being the um, low-rent uh, publishers he was working for, um, mm -hmm. including the kind of capitulation that allowed writers to disdain their own work while pocketing the money it brought in. It was to this company that Jean Delahir, Jean Delahir belonged. Not only did he re refrain from putting much literary effort into his work, but he deliberately employed methods and devices of which he was scornful. After 1907, he was a bad writer by design, and was glad to be bad by design, because it protected him from the awful possibility that he might be a bad writer, if, that he might be bad if he tried to be better. <laughs> 
yeah yeah it's uh it's 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 uh i'm doing it ironically of 190 1907 yeah yeah um so we should probably talk about uh this is actually um not necessarily influential but it's important step uh in the um evolution of what would become the superhero because this is one of the first um sort of pulpy action hero characters who has a specific superpower yes you can um see in this in case the dark very well. yes it's not uh it's not very impressive but uh it's all they had in 1909 so what are you gonna do he's the he's the richard b riddick of uh of, 19, <laughs> of 100 years earlier yeah but, uh, yes. I haven't actually seen those movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the same thing. His only special ability is that he can see in the dark. Uh, but he's also like a badass action guy. Yeah. But he has um, a special power. Um, and Riddick is at least uh, specifically indicated as a psychopath. Uh, whereas uh, Leo St. Clair is a heroic, wonderful guy who's heroic and wonderful all the time. Er, we're told that. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> We'll get um, into that. So, uh, as we said at the top, he's sort of officially sanctioned by the French government, but he can act on his own accord. He's sort of like a... He's not a, a superhero in the sense that he has a secret identity. Nictalope is just a nickname he's known by. Um, but um, uh, he has uh, sort of some superheroic traits. And um, yeah. the second book sort of leans into the whole supervillain thing as well. It's not so right. much in the first book, which you read. Yeah, uh, some of the other books, I, I, I read a bit of a synopsis of them, and it sounds like they get they get very super villainy. Some of the people he fights seem a little yeah, over the definitely top. by the but definitely by the second one. Um, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, let's. Well, I guess we should talk about. Uh, we alluded to it earlier that this um, spun out of another thing that uh, Dela Ear wrote. Um, yeah, I, I, I did want to say just quickly, um, like reading this one and then looking at before and after, um, it really does, it, you know, in this, we, when we talked about the John Eric Stark books in the, in the story that or we did, Eric with, John Stark, or, or, sorry, Eric John Stark books, um, they were, they had a, uh, by Lee Brackett, um, they kind of, they were almost like if you threw every, uh, science fantasy pulp fantasy swashbuckler uh like john carter tarzan all those other ones into conan into a blender uh you'd get eric john stark um because it, it hits so many of the the various beats of those and this hits so many of the various beats of like a steampunky or early you know early uh retro adventure vernsian wellsian type adventure like it it got it has so many of what we would associate with pulp looking back from a hundred years in the future. Um, like it, it's got airships, it's got a secret society. It's got, you know, it's got literally the, the Martians from war of the worlds in it. Right. Yeah. It's got it. Like literally, if you went down a checklist, you'd probably put a, you know, in the same way that something like the rocketeer, uh, or, or Indiana Jones and last, or, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark tries to hit, like deliberately the quote pulp beats that we're all familiar with. Whereas when you read actual pulp novels from that era, you know, they tend to be different because of course they didn't have a formula or various tropes that we were all familiar with. So they could often be weird and to our eyes off model, but this really feels like <laughs> the classic model of pulp in some ways. It's got so many of the things that we'd associate with it anyway. Uh, yeah. So uh, this series actually began in 1908 uh, by Lightyear's novel, uh, The Man Who Could Live Underwater. That's the English title. I'm going to go with the English titles for most of these because <laughs> yeah, I suck fine. at pronunciation. Um, yes. Leo St. Clair isn't actually in this one. Uh, the book stars his father, Theo Sinclair. Um, <laughs> yes. And isn't he uh, also this, called Jean St. Clair at a different point? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, the spelling of the names varies quite a bit in these books. Um, continuity wasn't one of... Uh, let your strong suits, um, if you can be said to have any strong suits at all. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Nick DeLove's own name changes throughout uh, some of the stories. So uh, the spelling changes. Uh, Saint Clair with E's at the end. Sinclair, De Sinclair, and Saint Clair is sort of the standardized one. Uh, the English translations, uh, Stable for Dead, seem to uh, standardize the spelling over the books, which is probably helpful hmm. um anyway so uh 
uh, actually, it doesn't technically star Theo Sinclair. It's actually about um, um, yeah. the hero he's is apparently uh, not a major character. Uh, yeah, Theo he's Sinclair. a he's a minor character um, uh, in the book. He's a Navy ensign uh, who works under the hero's um, uh, Charles Severac. I don't know how to right. pronounce that. Um, who goes up against uh, a villain named uh, Oxus, uh, who had created the uh, Hictonair, or Ictonair, a uh, mm. a shark man who could breathe underwater. Um, this was uh, done through actually grafting shark gills onto a human, which mm. would work, I guess. <laughs> if you're stupid, <laughs> you just um, it right on there. That's just yeah. what you do, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I, uh, as you can tell, I have not read this book. It hasn't been translated in the, into English, and uh, some of the synopses are sort of contradictory. So uh, this is the best I got for that one. But um, uh, let your sort of um, use some aspects of this and um, uh, established uh, or in his next book, which was uh, called. Uh, uh, the Mystery of the Fifteen, often translated into English as the, with a bunch better title of Nictalope on Mars. Um, mm. um, and this stars Leo Sinclair, or Leo St. Clair, um, uh, uh, who's explicitly the son of the uh, character from the previous book. And Oxus, the villain, is also the villain in this one. Sort of. Um, <laughs> so, and it's... Uh, it's um, Explicitly set 25 years later, which is uh, apparently a timeline or, issue. It was originally it? meant to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was originally meant to be set in the future, like the this, like the Nictalope on Mars would be set in the future, and it sort of mm -hmm. establishes that there are like international airline, you know. Right. Uh, there's there's airships. It's clearly futuristic for 19 what was it 1911 when this one came out yeah no it's futuristic for 1911 because airships are everywhere there are uh inter transatlantic uh uh air airlines or airship lines um and yeah but, the, in the sequel there are also uh submarine transports and things but, right yeah. and there's and i mean submarines like they have all this for 1911 futuristic technology the 15 although they are supposed to have been sort of developing this secretly so it's not a hundred percent clear what's supposed to be but they talk about radio planes as being maybe not a huge deal to most of the people there at the time as well um yeah it's, um it, it's ambiguous and um certainly uh 25 years after the events of a novel that was written you know four years ago right implies that it's a future but then right. later um uh, he inserts uh, Camille Flammarion, who was a real person, into the narrative, mm -hmm. sort of. Uh, a fraud right. pretending to be him, but supposedly would still be alive in this time. So that right. sort of roots it in either the future or, or either the present or like three years from now or something. So it doesn't yeah. really make sense. And that pushes the man who could live underwater into the Victorian era instead of right. if you when go it was written. backwards. Plus it's... Plus, it's basically got to be an alternate present again, where there's all these yeah. crazy airships, which is a little but, easier for us to to buy yeah, nowadays. It, looking back and make and say it's a steampunk timeline or whatever, but and it sort of works anyway because it establishes that the Martian invasion of Earth from War of the Worlds actually happened in this universe, right? And that um, uh, A.C. Wells was more of a biographer, which is, I think, sort of the most interesting thing about this first book that it, it treats it sort of takes the meta approach to. Mm -hmm. Uh, to other yes. books, it sort of implies that some Vern books happened happened as well. So. Well, it, it's funny because, of course, one of the ones we did early on, again at your uh, behest, was um, the uh, the uh, the the uh, conquest of the Monkey King, um, uh, the 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 follow up to uh, Saturn and Ferendel. Sa Saturn and Ferendel, the follow up to Jules Verne, um, because that's a sequel to multiple Jules Verne stories. <laughs> you know, it's 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 fanfic, and that's maybe a little bit more of a comic comedic riff on it, but still it's him, you know, fanficking his way, uh, yeah. to a sequel. And this is the same thing. It's a fanfic sequel to war of the worlds in that way. Yeah. And there, there were actually a few of those, um, uh, including one where Thomas Edison takes revenge on the Martians. Right. Um, most of them completely missed the point of the original book. <laughs> <Yeah>. Um, um, <laughs> 
people which people isn't really an action like story. Worlds, yeah. What? Yeah. But, well, people people really liked War of the Worlds. Like it was clearly made a huge impact on everyone. Um, yeah. I, I you know I I always hear it described as uh, the first real like alien invasion story. Um. um in, a, in a sense. Yeah. That, not quite, but yeah, pretty much like the first really popular one. Yeah, it was certainly the one that made an impact, but it was also like. Because other stories would be, oh, we go to Mars and we meet the Martians on Mars. We humans who build our spacecraft and go to Mars. Whereas this was like, yeah, but what if they have spacecrafts and come here and they're not nice? <laughs> like that was, yeah, uh, that was something. There was an thought. earlier uh, sort of story from, um, uh, I wasn't expecting to talk about this, so I forget his name. Um, uh, he wrote uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Oh, um, um, uh, Irving, Washington Irving. Irving. Washington Irving, thank you. Yeah. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, Knickerbocker's History of New York, which had a little aside. It was framed as uh, in the sentence as a as in the paragraph as a hypothetical, but it has some science fiction elements. Uh, like what if people from the moon wrote you know, griffins and hippogriffs and bears and things uh, <laughs> arrived on Earth and, and subjugated all our subjugated everybody and forced our kings to parade in front of them as uh as prizes and stuff huh. and it was it was a metaphor for our for europeans treatment of native americans but right right um which but it's it's framed entirely as a hypothetical but it, it sort of has the so it's not really a science fiction story but it has a lot of those elements to it yeah yeah and that well, was from the early war- 1800s right and war of the worlds is I mean, it is H.G. Uh, Wells' socialist, it's the same thing of, you know, where an imperialist nation goes around conquering everyone, what if that happened to us? And that was, yeah, that exactly. was the, the basis for and, the um, And this book is very nationalistic uh, in favor of France, and the uh, the Thomas Edison one was very nationalistic in favor of the U.S., so it's interesting right. that they, you know, utterly missed the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They kind of went, you know, well, America would give them what for they would, yeah. and France would give them what for those aliens. This also actually, I mean, we'll get there, but it, it eventually, it, it does come around to kind of being sympathetic to the Martians. Uh, um, it, it uh, it's really, um, how about we just talk about the ending, because it doesn't... Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the middle part later, but, um, so they get to Mars and they they it's fight. It's a very some... random book. There's a lot of arbitrary yeah. terms um, in the story, anyway. But uh, it, it sort of sets up that there are these uh, humanoid, roughly humanoid Martians who are uh, used as food for the um, what this book calls the kefales, uh, from kefales, the Greek for yeah. head. Kefales. Kefales. Um, um, or kapales, uh, I guess. If it's Greek, I don't know. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Usually in modern uh, sort of pastiches, they're called Sarmax, which is a thing from a fanfic mixing them with uh, John Carter. Sort of, um, it took off uh, since the 80s or 90s, I think, but it's sort of the standard phrase for them now. Sarmac? Um, Sarmac. Sarmac. What? Oh, anyway, okay. Well, it's just I, gibberish, I but it sort of took off. Okay. <laughs> As the Martian name for them. Okay. Anyway, I just thought I'd add that. But here they're called... Because uh, they're not given a name in the original. They're just Martians. And right. If you're establishing different races of Martians, you can't just call them, you know, right. whales-type Martians or whatever, because that yeah. doesn't make any sense. Well, it, it is um, funny that they they literally stop in the middle of, like, a fairly exciting moment, and somebody's like, it's crazy that we're calling them Martians, right? Like, we wouldn't call humans <laughs> Earthlings, so what do we call them? And they come up with a name, Catholic. And then they go on with the adventure, like, just stop dead in the middle for a few paragraphs. Yeah, they, they name it and give their reasoning, and they say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And it does, uh, it's just a weird point in the story to do that, because yeah, it's, like, yeah. nearing the climax that they do that. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's established that there's another race that are sort of used as food, and uh, the Nyctalope makes contact with them, and they clearly have language in there. Um, but then at the end, uh, Nyctalope just makes peace with the uh, with the uh, Kefels. Um And um, it's established that uh, these aren't the ones that invaded Earth in, um, in War of the Worlds, but that was the northern Martians right. who did that. Uh, uh, identical yeah. in, in appearance, but a different group. And uh, right. that the um, the slave the bipedal slave Martians 
are just animals, so it's okay that they're they're being eaten and slaughtered and stuff. Well, not exactly. Even though they he have language. Goes, he kind of goes, you know, well, it's inevitable they're going to have to keep eating these. Because the Martians literally feed on their blood, which is from the Wells novel. At least yeah. they, would, they would feed on the blood of humans. And this is sort of... Uh, it's established that, that they have uh, sort of humanoid-ish um, yeah. uh, food sources. So. Right. Which initially are animals, then they can talk. And then at the end, they're like, well, we're making people with Martians. Well, I guess they're going to have to continue to eat these intelligent life forms. Whatever. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's a matter of... Um, uh, we should talk about how these books were written, because they're uh, serialized. Um, uh, a thing that didn't really take off in other... Or, like, um, so put out, like, a chapter at a time, and he'd be writing every day and putting out stuff. But it was very uh -huh. influenced by reader reaction, both between serials and within them. So uh -huh. a writer starting out wouldn't have an idea of where it would end because um, they know they will get feedback and be told to go in different directions. So mm -hmm. um, uh, Leyer wouldn't have actually had an idea of uh, maybe a rough idea, but not a clear idea of where this was going. And right. um, we don't know quite what happened, but possibly it just um, yeah. the publishers said this isn't selling anymore, so they said to cut it short, and he just sort of ended it. <laughs> yeah. And it's really slapdash at the end there. I mean, it's slapdash all over, but, like, the ending really... Yeah, just comes to an end, yeah. Which is weird if that was what happened, because then he wrote, like, a dozen more Nyctalope books, so somebody uh, liked the it, you know? the, the, the following one was written ten years later, so maybe there was a oh, okay. thing there. But yeah, I, I'm yeah. It I'm is... not sure the behind the scenes thing fully on this, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. It might have yeah. News. It was the newspaper uh, serialized. It was a newspaper, literally, I believe that the serialized uh, it. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I think it was called Le Martin or something. Um, Le, Ma Le Matin. Yeah, it means Le Matin. It just means the morning. It's it's a common. Okay, name and it was apparently the French. like one of the most down market of these. Right. That you could write for. So like he was. You know, writing yeah. for the bottom of the barrel. Mm. It's the old um, penny a word thing. I don't know if that was literally what he got, but yeah. Back yeah. in the day, pulp writers used to get just, you know, a few, a penny a word. So they'd, they'd just keep grinding it out like that. But um, it it does, it, they, the thing is, though, some of it is very clearly, oh yeah, I'm making it up as I go along and I'm just pounding out the word count. But there are bits that he must have had in mind. Like, we get to about the two-thirds mark in the story, and all the villains seem to have been vanquished. And then you're like, oh, what? but wait, they're invading Mars and they're going to have to fight the Martians, who don't show up until quite late into the story. Um, yeah, they don't get to Mars even until halfway through. Right. But that is all clearly set up from the beginning. Like, he, he talks about H.G. Wells and the Martians... Oh, like, yeah. No, right uh, like, he beginning. would have had a rough idea, but not know exactly where it's going. Right. Basically. But, I mean, he must have known that eventually it's going to be them crossing paths with the Martians. But it is really... Yeah, but I, I have the feeling that they were the Martians were going to be villains in this, and then he had to cut it short. I, I mean, they are villains, but, yeah, yeah they, they end with something resembling peace. And that's the thing, like... So, it's... It literally... And, and we haven't even mentioned, like, the bulk of the book is... A secret society. The, you, you mentioned the 15. It's called, you know, uh, the Nyctalope versus the 15, um, or the mystery of the 15 was the original title. And yeah. um, it, they, uh, they're a secret society. It literally starts with them abducting women from Earth and taking them to Mars on radio planes. And they're set up as this big elaborate set of villains. Um, and then, you know, having them plus the Martians... And they're led by the Oxus, who is the villain in the underwater one. Right, right. So he's following off from that, but it is weird that he's got them and he's got, like, a sequel to War of the Worlds mashed together. It's kind of, like, it's a lot thrown together into one book. Um, the the, the and, and then the other thing, and as I say, they end up making a sort of peace with the Martians. He's really... Um, big on the idea of making up with your enemies, isn't he? <laughs> like, um, that happens throughout this book repeatedly. The villains uh, end up... Yeah, being... he, he does try to give um, uh, Lucifer a few outs in the sequel as well, but <laughs> Luc he does end up killing him. literally Lucifer. Yeah. Well, well, sure, but I mean, in, the, in this book, it's like he, uh, you know, he's doing battle with this secret 
uh, sinister group. I mean, they kidnap women. And it was literally taking them to Mars, I think, to form a new society on Mars. Yeah, and yeah. be forced to marry these the 15 leaders of the 15, obviously. Um, yeah, and, um, and there's some... It's the the subplot with the uh, with the women sort of um, manipulating the the men into yeah them become that's, good. It, it's so that's, weird. That's hilarious because it's it's the most ineffectual secret society. Like supposedly they've got these these goals that are like firmly oh we follow our master we're like a cult but they all get like women who they've kidnapped and immediately become like. Oh, we're in love with you, and the women are like, "Okay, uh, do what we say," and they're like, "Okay, we will." Like it, they just become to the point where, and then uh, you know, one of the main leaders of the fifty, not the leader, not Oxus, a guy called uh, Koinos, uh, he ends up. That's it, right? Koinos, that was his name. I thought and it was Konyos, but whatever. Con- Konyos, yeah. Um, he he ends up um, basically betraying the fifteen out of love for the woman who is. Uh, St. Clair's uh, uh, fiance and girlfriend, or girlfriend at least, and um, he they falls get in love married with her. later in this book. Um, right. Oh, that that's a each book has a different love interest, and he gets married to them in almost every one of them, and then <laughs> they're never mentioned again. Yeah, I've heard that the second book a, even says this... he had t- they had two children, and then she's not mentioned in the third book. It's so weird. I've heard I, it's I, James no, Bond, maybe... but taken to an um degree because. At least the yeah. one that James Bond married, you know, gets killed on screen. Yeah, well, my understanding is that uh, Xavier, who's the, uh, the the love interest in this one, um, is, like, they form a Martian colony that gets wiped out between books later so that he could be single again in the other one. But I don't uh, that's know... Not, if... That's not ever referenced in the actual books. I think that it's, like, subsequent writers going in and oh, okay. patching things up. All um right. Yeah. That okay, that makes more sense then. Or well, it doesn't really make more sense, but it. But yeah, it's 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 a little dark for that to happen. Like I, I'm never a big fan of that. Of like, uh, let's uh, hit the reset button by murdering everyone. You know. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no, he, he like Koinos uh, falls in love with this with Xavier and basically betrays the fifteen. Uh, goes and helps. Uh, um. Uh the Nyctalope and ends up being executed by the 15. But then the Nyctalope meets Oxus, who's the leader of the 15. And I don't know how he's portrayed in the first book, but in this case, he literally just has a conversation with Oxus and Oxus is like, yeah, you rule. I suck. You should be in charge of the 15 from now on. And the Nyctalope becomes the leader of the 15 from one conversation that they have with each other. Well, he's just such a great man, obviously. Just radiates so, greatness. He's so cool. I have to make put him in charge of the fifteen. Like that happens repeatedly throughout the book. People just meet the Nyctalope, and he's so cool that they have to they have to just surrender and switch teams and join him. That happens and, a lot in the second one too. So I think it's a series <laughs> con- constant. Well, I mean, it's kind of nice. And literally, the second book, uh, the second half of this book is called the triumph of love and it's literally like okay you know whatever you want to say about lahir um he believed in the power of love apparently (laughs) like or he he thought his readers did anyway yeah he 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 believed that well i i mean just the fact that he goes back to it over and over again it's it's literally like well there's nothing you can't do if you have either a nice conversation or a woman who you fall in love with and become completely devoted to <laughs> and renounce evil and become a good guy. Um, and and there's one moment where there's one guy who worked for the 15. Well, there's one of the, one of the 15 is not, he's, I guess, extra evil because he's not amenable to falling in love. This is Kipper. And uh, he goes, they send him off on a mission while he flips everyone else in the 15 to, to be on his side. And Kipper has an illegitimate son who's the one member who goes, uh, this is ins-. Like, he's portrayed as evil, but it's like, he's the one guy who's like, am I going nuts here? Did everyone just flip sides all of a sudden? <laughs> so evil he raises- and in a very racist way, because he's half African. He's half African, but he is, like, he is, he's by far the most interesting character in the book. Um, like he's, he, he, he seems like a normal human being and everyone else and it's portrayed as like, oh, he's evil, but it's like, yeah, he has freedom of thought essentially. And he realizes that the Nyctalope is bad news. So he races off to get his dad and then 
that gets sab- he gets sabotaged really quickly and dies. Yeah, like Stableford uh, describes this as an idiot plot. He directly <laughs> says that in the opening. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's, it's like really... uh, the villains. The villains are stupid, so the Nickelope also has to be stupid to be barely winning over. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's, yeah, it, it, like, he doesn't do anything to check the fact that he just trusts, and, and it, he says repeatedly, like, early on, he captures a bad guy, and he's like, if you give me your solemn oath, I'll let you go, because I know your solemn oath will mean that you, you are devoted to me, and they do, like, the people he captures in the, in the, uh, the, the, um, the radio wave emitter, which transmits the radio plane to Mars, um, they have to be good now for him to be able to fly and not, and for them not to crash his plane. Uh, and again, he just has a nice conversation with them, and they decide to go become good guys. Um, oh yeah, that plane thing. Uh, that's hilarious because um, the radio planes have to be in constant contact with the uh, transmitter mm-hmm. in order to fly, or right. else they'll you know fall fall out they'll of fall you out know, of space. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, Lear forgot that the Earth. You know, not only revolves, but also you know moves. Right. So like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. It, it's just so stupid. Like yeah. that's I I feel like you know cinema sins here complaining, but like that <laughs> fundamentally does not make sense. That's just, yeah. That yeah, it, this it, whole it's... thing it relies on the Earth being stationary, and it's not. Right. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I feel like that's something. Even though, and Stableford rags on him for it as well. And I, I do feel like nineteen eleven. Again, this is a modern. Obviously, it was meant to be like quote real science fiction at the time. But so I guess you can give it a hard time for that. But I do feel like you know, for to a modern audience, like it's all ridiculous retro sci-fi anyway. So I, you know, I, I find it hard to get <laughs> bent out of shape about that. But you're right. I mean, he did know better. People did know better at the time uh, that that yeah. wouldn't that didn't make any sense. You know, that's why you need satellites and geosynchronous orbit, for instance, if you're going to have you know consistent uh, consistent things. But yeah, it's 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 uh, it, you know, obviously the science is kind of ramshackle. And he spends yeah. a lot of time going, like, pursuing his own little, it's, it's, you know, it's Moby Dick-esque, where he takes a little aside to talk about whatever weird little uh, bit of world building or pseudo-scientific thing he's he's interested uh, in. Yeah, Lear, in this book at least, really thought that uh, airplane wings would flap. Right, yeah, that was... And that that's, that's kind of a the- common early thing, but it's it's funny to read in retrospect. Which is weird because airplanes existed at this point. Like they, they didn't. Yeah, but he thought that would be the future of, of air travel, I guess. Yeah, it's it's weird, and I mean, he has effectively zeppelins, which also existed at the time, I believe. Um, oh yeah, and and you know, you've got these two major forms of flight already in existence, and he's coming up with this other one in which the wings flap it's kind of weird um but there you go um but all the zeppelins it, it you know it, it is very airship obsessed which you know you can't blame him for that's kind of cool uh that's that's one of those things we always associate with with uh with you know retro sci-fi and and pulp and so forth and and there were actually uh, uh our our friend jess nevins actually wrote a whole article about it but there was literally a boom of airship magazines, I think around this time. Um, like that was a whole literal brand of pulp was airship pulp. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, because it was, I mean, it, understandable the same way that, you know, space travel exploded once uh, you got to the fifties, that became a whole genre and so forth. You know, the cool new technology is going to excite everyone's pulp sensibilities, but it is interesting that <laughs> he's got all this stuff in that story and he had to, Make up all this sci-fi stuff, anyway. Um, yeah. So, um, have we sort of finished with the Mars one, or? Yeah, uh, I, I think we've gone over it's. You know, we've gone over most of it. Like I say, it's very arbitrary. This happened, and then this happened, and then yeah. plot twist. This happened, but you, yeah, tell me about the Lucifer story, Nick uh, Yeah. Lucifer. So, uh, ten years later, like you wrote, uh, uh, I think it's just called Lucifer, uh, mm-hmm. but it was translated as Nick versus Lucifer. Right. Um, uh, here he goes up against a powerful psychic sorcerer named Baron Glow von Vartek, 
a uh, German sort of. Um, it's from a um, he's from a, the Vartex in the book uh, were exiled from Germany um, hundreds of years ago and sent to the Bermudas, uh, where they live in an underground in a giant rock, um, and uh, they sort of have formed a cult over the over the centuries, um, obsessed with technology. But uh, their leader becomes like a uh, un he goes into esoteric training and becomes a sorcerer. And he has psychic powers and he can control people at long distances and communicate over over distances and create you know force fields that people can't go through. And um, uh, he has an ultimate uh, evil plan of uh, um, increasing his psychic power through something called the radio dynamo, uh, an invention he made that runs on radium um, and uh, it would extend his power to all the world, but before that, he sort of just sort of dicks around and uh, threatens people. Uh, it starts off with him threatening um, uh, a banker, I think, to give money to a uh, anarchist group, and like it makes no sense with what he wants to do later, but whatever. Um, anarchist sequel bad, I guess. Um, yeah. Well, that uh, is that we've we've seen that. Uh... Anyway, sorry. Go on. We're gonna. I know we're gonna talk about that later. But yeah, go on. Uh, nihilists. <laughs> yeah, actually, nihilists come up later. Uh, um, right. In a, in another book. Um, so uh, there's a showdown uh, against uh, Glovon Vartek uh, between the Nictolo, um, who's trying to rescue his his fiance again, or his girlfriend in this case, like a past girlfriend. Sorry, it's you know, a lot of stuff happens in these, and it's. None of it's very interesting. Um, yeah, it's all just random plot twists, yeah. Yeah, so uh, there's a showdown in Germany in Castle Schwarzrock, Schwarzrock um, uh, and, um, uh, but uh, Glovon Vartek gets away, and then there's a whole adventure in the Bermudas. Uh, Nick Delope ends up uh, convincing one of the female Vartex to come to his side because she just falls in love with him instantly. Um which again goes to your thing where like he's just so great that people just see that and like you're awesome I need to follow you. Um, That's sort of a James Bond thing in that case, isn't it? Where he he flips the the ladies. Yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> the, a lot of James Bond in lady. this book as well. Um, yeah. There are a lot of the worst aspects of James Bond. Um, uh, Anyway, yeah, so uh, the book sort of runs on an important plot point that radium has hypnotic properties, uh, which Stableford points out that um, uh, this isn't that um, uh, unusual because radium had recently been discovered and there was a recent rise in, um, in spiritualism because of World War I. You know, all the people died and right. people were looking for answers and, or to contact loved ones and so forth. And radium was also a new thing, so it was not, and it glowed, so it sort of looked supernatural. Mm. So people sort of, it, it seems natural that people would put them together. Um, but this book could only have, as Stableford also points out, this book could only have been written in the brief period between the discovery of radium and the discovery that radium kills you. Right. Uh, because um, Well, they that's just, almost like a f forerunner of, you know, say, Marvel Comics being obsessed with uh, you know, <laughs> radiation will give you superpowers kind of thing. Yeah. You know? Well, in this case, they bathe themselves in radioactive, radioactive gas to, uh, to stop psychic, to stop the Lucifer's psychic powers from entering. Mm -hmm. So the, the climax is literally a bunch of guys in, um, uh, in, uh, you know, diving belt or diving suits, uh, that are filled with radioactive gas, just, you know, marching on the enemy's base in the North Pole. <laughs> okay. Like these these people are gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a cool image, though. I guess, but it's it's. I mean, I can't blame uh, Lear for this. I'll, I'll forgive him this one because yeah. <laughs> right. he, he didn't know that it was radioactive. But it's just kind of funny how badly this aged. Uh, Lucifer also ends with a uh, the first <clears throat> example I've seen of this trope, where uh, the villain having lost and he's sort of dying. Um, he triggers the self-destruct uh, thing in his base, and the heroes have to run away. I haven't seen any yeah. earlier examples of that. It probably happened somewhere, but it's like a standard trope nowadays in like Bond movies, and you know, even the Predator did it. You know, um, 
it's just sort of interesting that uh, this sort of predicted that uh, trope really taking off. Um, yeah, so there are 15 other Nyctalope stories written by uh, Lightyear. Uh, are they all novels or just 15 stories? Uh, yeah, there's some novels, some short stories, and some novellas. Um, so I haven't read any of them past the second one, because these were long. I mean, we, we haven't really... They're long books. Uh, the second right. one more so well, than the first one. Well, it's the, it's the Charles Dickens thing, where he just he kept pounding them out. Like, it was almost like the mo the equivalent of a TV show. Uh, you know, you just, you'd just go in for that week's installment of the... the yeah, the there's a lot adventures. of padding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so let's see, uh, from, but from the plot descriptions I've read, uh, one of them he discovers a lost race of Amazons in Tibet. Um, he travels to a newly discovered planet toy named Rhea and makes peace between two warring races. Uh, there are bat people on the sun facing side and ape people on the night facing side. And apparently that's correct. The bat people are on the sun side, so. <laughs> okay. That's weird. There you go. Um, <laughs> Uh, he fights uh, supervillains uh, named uh, Leonid Zatan and Titania, who are apparently sort of recurring enemies. Um, and um, uh, Zatan has a time-traveling son who tries to take revenge on him. Hmm. That sounds kind of interesting, actually. Uh, and there's some traveling son? Time travel. Yeah, like he comes back from the future to kill him? Yeah. He... Okay, yeah. that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I might... Nah, I'm not going to check that out. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. uh, and well, there's yeah. uh, there's a lot of uh, yellow peril stuff. And yeah, well, there was something about a pain people trying to forge a pain Asiatic empire that would be, in, yeah. you were saying, an anarchist hell. <laughs> you know, and it's it's very much coming from a uh, an anarchist you know, empire, right? An anarchist <laughs> empire <laughs> of yellow peril stereotypes so it's really yeah. got all the all the boogeymen of the uh yeah the early 20th century piled but apparently a, a few of them have like fu manchu type villains so yeah um i mean we so, talked uh, about when we did um the angel of the revolution show terror in the skies is the name of the show uh and we talked about how that was reflecting a lot of uh both of the time in terms of sci-fi and politics and also was very prescient and you see everyone getting like, again, this is the era when anarchism became a boogeyman and everyone was afraid of it. And to this day we say anarchism, anarchy will reign. And you know, whereas anarchy is this specific detailed political philosophy, it's not, you know, it's not creating, it's not just creating chaos, but that's what yeah, the, the name anarchy. literally means, uh, without yeah. or uh, against being against hi hierarchies right and and you, but you can definitely see some of the and of course pulp, pulp tends to be a bit more reactionary and a bit more protective of as we as we're saying in this like there's there's nationalism and it's for the for the french nation and all that kind of stuff and uh, so that kind of stuff is usually you know painted as a boogeyman whereas you know terror in the skies makes it makes them the heroes essentially um, yeah, but you, you can see, and and you met one of the later books that he's fighting the nihilists, right? That was our yeah. Uh, I was about to say that uh, this is his origin book, which is the tenth book in the series. Mm -hmm. um, his father, uh, here retconned as a scientist, is attacked by nihilists mm -hmm. uh, trying to steal his latest invention, um, and uh, a twenty-year-old Leo teams up with two of his classmates to try to stop them, but he got shot in the process. He wakes up in the hospital seemingly blind, but it turns out his vision has actually improved and he can see in the dark. Then he goes back to fighting the Nihilists, but they capture and torture him and stab him in the heart. And he goes back to the hospital where the doctor gives him a newly invented artificial heart. <laughs> yeah. So, so you think the artificial... Yeah, the artificial heart is a later retcon. It's um, yeah. uh, not, ex not in the first few books, but it's a common thing in descriptions of the character. Yeah. That he's uh, one of the first cyborgs in fiction, which I think is overstating things. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, an artificial heart. I mean, yeah, technically, but that's correct. But the, but the eyes, though, like the ability to see in the dark, so that just happens because he was shot and yeah. then develops that and, ability? Yeah, because I, I, I would have thought it was, you know, the artificial heart would be connected to his vision powers or something, but it's just two entirely different coincidences. <laughs> okay. Uh, like I said, I have not read this one, but 
Yeah. Yeah. No, this that sounds sound very right impressive. For this guy, yeah. <laughs> like, and then he, you know, fell off a cliff, and when he went out of the hospital, he could, you know, eat metal and like, like, <laughs> just random things keep happening to him every time he goes to the hospital. Yeah. Uh, the artificial heart has been explained in uh, sort of modern writers to explain why he uh, doesn't seem to age over the course of the, you know, like 20 plus years these stories take place over. So Right. Yeah. Uh, but it's not explicit in the originals as far as I know. Right. Well, I mean... It's I more like he, how, you know, Batman doesn't age. You yeah, know, just, I, I was going to say, I think it's the same reason most fictional characters that last for a long time don't age, is is that. That's why Sherlock Holmes didn't age for 50 years or whatever. Yeah. Well, I guess he did age in the stories, but anyway, they didn't emphasize that aspect. Yeah, he's like yeah. anyone else. Um, but yeah, no, and, and again, with the nihilists... We have to talk about Saturn. And, remember in Saturn and Ferrandel, we yeah, thought yeah. that was like a weird joke that that was. Not yeah, us, yeah. We and that's... we brought up the Big Lebowski, but apparently this is a big thing. Yeah, they were terrified apparently. of nihilists. <laughs> that's right. Well, and and I think that was kind of like people would say of you know socialists and anarchists and people who are fighting the power that oh they believe in nothing they are nihilists <laughs> they want to destroy us you know but yeah it's not fair. <laughs> Exactly. Well, as you say, so that was uh, that was what that was what came out of that one. But yeah, it's it is it it is funny now whenever you see these stories from that time period, and it's like we gotta fight the nihilists. But hey, it's a real thing. Anyway, um, uh, no, no, uh, so you mentioned this earlier, but um, uh, one of the reasons why this um series stopped is because uh, Nazi, you know. The Nazis came into Paris uh, during mm -hmm. World War, came into France during World War II, uh, and uh, Lahire, Lahire decided uh, he didn't really care, so he was going to continue publishing under the uh, uh, now Nazi-controlled publishing companies, and uh, mm -hmm. he published several, uh, or at least two, Nyctalope short stories during this period, uh, and the Nyctalope is presented as being on good terms with Vicky, Vicky, Vicky? V Vichy France, yeah. Vichy France, thank you. Sorry, I've never heard that out loud. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, this superhero is a Nazi collaborator, so that's fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, does it, now, do they mention the Nazis in the stories, or just the Vichy? Yeah, government? yeah, apparently they, they mention, like, he's on good terms with the new government, that sort of thing. Mm. Mm. Which was Nazi-controlled. But they don't, do they, but don't, they don't say, quote, Nazis, they just say... The they Vichy might, I, I don't France. know, I haven't read them, so... Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so, um, it's, it's, uh, it's similar to the Tain story from that period where they, they kind of, you know, they kind of made it like, if you don't know, you wouldn't know from reading the story, but it was done under the Nazis and it kind of adhered to what they wanted <laughs> from their, uh, from their stories at that time. Right. Uh, yeah. So Lair and his, uh, co-editor, uh, Andre, uh, Bertrand, Bertrand, um, were um, a number among a number of publishers were blacklisted uh, by the uh, uh, syn syndicated of editors. I'm just going to say that okay. um, English uh, for collaboration with the Nazis. Uh, he was arrested in uh, 1945 in May and tried in December. Uh, the judgment confirmed his permanent exclusion from the world of French publishing. Uh, he also he escaped from uh, custody in February 1946 while being transferred to a hospital, uh, but was uh, condemned in absentia uh, in 1948 to 10 years, imprisonment, and the loss of citizenship rights. He never served those terms. He sort of escaped. To where? Uh, I don't... I forgot to write that down. Sorry. <laughs> Probably so another European anyway. country or something. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, so, yeah, sort of an ignoble uh, end to this whole thing. Yeah, it's, it, it, you know, I've, I've seen that brought up as a reason why we don't really talk about the Nyctalope, even though he's kind of a, a pulp staple of the era, because... Yeah, he, I mean, part of it's that it's not very good, and part of it's this. Oh, but, um, but I mean, a lot of the pulp characters were not very good. This is act. I don't think this is in characteristic of a lot of pulp of that era for that exact reason. Um, like, I, I'm not sure the, the quality is that much lower than some of the you know, pulp that you might uh, reference and talk about of that era, but... Um, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, Nick Lope has been brought back um, 
in comics recently. Um, mm -hmm. A few case, a few places. Uh, one, uh, he appears in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Um, I think that uh, issue was written before uh, these books were even translated into English, because uh, uh, it's clear that Alan Moore did not read them. Um, the Nyctalope is depicted as having gills, like the like the Fishman, so he probably confused it with um, the synopsis. Sort of confused it with the earlier book. Maybe I, 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 yeah, I don't know. I mean, Moore takes his li own liberties. Yeah, but that's a pretty like, extreme one. I don't he's, know. He's only very well. I think it might have been him trying to com like he might have deliberately been trying to combine the two different ideas. And I guess I, I think he, I think um, he's only mentioned fairly briefly, like in a yeah, yeah. He's story. only brought up in like yeah, in the um, in a prose section, yeah. Um, uh, he also, uh, uh, Nick Delob also appeared under the name The Eye in the, uh, French comic series, um, uh, uh, Chimera Brigade, um, which I've read half of because that's the only part that's been translated. I, I thought there was more, I thought that was it, but apparently there's another half that hasn't been translated <laughs> into English. So. We should say there's, like, it, it, there's a whole, uh, array of French and German especially, uh, pulp characters from that era like it was you know we tend to focus on british and and american uh characters on this podcast but of course there was no particular reason why the english language characters had to be the most <laughs> excuse me definitive ones it was it was because you know like yeah french and, and german and we have talked briefly about the german uh characters yeah. via the um. uh, the, the Dr. Mabuse stuff, but yeah, it was all sort of going back and forth uh, between the different countries in some ways, but... Uh, yeah, so I would recommend the Chimera Brigade if you speak French, <laughs> but if not, you're not going to get the full story, so... But you don't speak French. How can you recommend it? <laughs> because I've read, read the first three, I've read the first half, so... Yeah, yeah fair enough. Um, okay, And cool. uh, I think, um, oh yeah, and uh, I used Nick Lopin, Nick Delope in my own comic, uh, uh, Apex Society. Uh, he's in the first issue briefly, along with uh, some other French characters, and he'll be appearing soon again. Uh, I plan okay. to play him as sort of a foil to the to the main characters and as a backstabbing jackass. Because you don't like the Nyctalope. He is. Yeah, he's not a very even in the stories. You know, he, you could call it uh, you know sa character character assassination, but you know it's not hard to. To, to be a to not like this guy, unfortunately, he collaborated with the Nazis, people. Yes, exactly. Um, well, since it's growing dark and we don't have special eyesight, let's bid adieu, uh, French again, uh, to all you uh, for another two weeks. We've been Philip Rice and Adam Prosser, who politely take turns running our secret organization. Uh, thanks to Alex Ross for manning our trans etheric radio wave station. And to Jack Farrick, Underwater Shark Man, for the theme song. Uh, just want to remind everyone that we both have Patreons, and subscribers can listen to the show a week early. Just look under Philip Rice or Adam Prosser at Patreon.com, or go to Never Sleeps Network slash series slash what dash mad dash universe for the links. Uh, if you sign up, you also get comics, illustrations, and other stuff, and you'll help us afford the hosting and recording costs. You can also get this podcast via iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or your podcaster of choice. And if you enjoy it, please leave a review. It would, it would also help us if you spread the word about What Mad Universe. Tell your friends and link us on your social media. Uh, tell your friends and link to us on your social media. Until next time, good night, and remember to look where you're going. <laughs>